Welcome to Lifestyle Solopreneur, the community for entrepreneurs who put lifestyle first. Join your host, Flavia Barris, as she interviews successful lifestyle solopreneurs and shares ideas to help you find the perfect balance between lifestyle, business, and self. Flavia is an attorney, marketing expert, and founder of several online academies. She's been featured in major media, including BBC World News, The Wall Street Journal, The New York Post, ESPN Television, and more. Join us for this episode of Lifestyle Solopreneur. Hey, Lifestyle Solopreneurs. Today, we get to speak with Carrie DePhillips. She is the CEO of The Content Factory, a digital PR agency that specializes in SEO and social media marketing. Their portfolio has featured a wide variety of of purpose-driven brands, many of which you've heard before, including Astroglide, Fairtrade America, Innovise, Hollywood, enterprise-level SaaS companies, and a lot of others in between. They represent multiple billion-dollar accounts, and Serpstat recently named her one of the top three women in the SEO industry. Carrie and her team have been featured in Forbes, Fast Company, Inc., Entrepreneur, and many other media outlets for digital marketing expertise and work culture at their company. Thrive named her a limit-breaking female founder, and NBC News referred to her as a CEO who takes job perks to the max due to the fact that all of her employees, 100% of her employees, work from home or wherever there's Wi-Fi. Welcome to the show, Carrie. Thanks so much for having me. I'm very excited to be here. And I love the fact that you honor just kind of that, that new movement towards a remote work and the fact that a lot of people are actually way more productive working from home than they would be at an office where they had to commute there and there's all the temptation of coworkers chit-chatting and you know you have to actually probably leave the office to go get lunch so your lunch break ends up being longer and but you embrace that and you're like hey all my people I trust you to work from home better than you would in an office and um, that you promote that lifestyle how did that come about So I founded The Content Factory in 2010. I got my start in advertising and I worked the traditional advertising job. I would commute 45 minutes, struggle through traffic downtown, pay the privilege, hundreds of dollars a month, park. And then I'd still have to like, either I'd change shoes and wear sneakers or I'd keep my heels on. And it was just like a... uh, up to the office, elevator, the high rise. And I hated that. I felt like it was really unnecessary. And so when I left the advertising job and went into organic marketing, specifically search engine optimization, I found my way there through freelancing. I have a variety of resources that will be, I can send you for your show notes. But one of the resources is how to hack Craigslist for remote work. And I worked this process. There's a YouTube video that like clearly outlines it to find my first freelance clients, freelance writing clients, while I was still working in advertising. And within three months, I had replaced my full time income. It was a great job, you know, minus all the other crap, but I had replaced fully my income with freelance work. And Eventually, it took a couple of years, but eventually I had more work than I could handle and I founded the content factory. And when I did, I ran the math on how much time I was spending on the like get ready to do the work I was already ready to do routine, including commute. And it worked out to over 500 hours per year of me spending an hour to get ready. I have a challenging hair texture, so it takes a while to tame that mane. And then commuting to the office, commuting back from the office. Sometimes I would get into fender benders. There were parking tickets. There was a lot of gas involved. So like it's environmentally friendly, but from like a lifestyle perspective, the second I no longer worked in advertising and I did my own thing and I structured that as like a, a digital first workplace or work environment, I saved myself 500 hours per year. And I felt that. And my budget felt that. I imagine the environment felt that to a certain extent. And I've maintained that throughout the growth of my company. Certainly, like COVID forced a lot of companies to, well, like the world, right, to work remote. You're starting to see some of that roll back, but you're also seeing a lot of pushback from workers who are like, you know, 
no, I'm not going to buy into this anymore. And when you can work from home, you can work from anywhere. And then the lifestyle optimization really kicks in. Because you can work from anywhere geographically. For some people, though, there's challenges working from home. So I think there are so many benefits, all of which you touched on. But for a lot of people, there's also kind of that flip side and the challenges. What do you think are some of the challenges and ways that you keep from sort of falling down those speed bumps? I mean, it depends on the individual workers type of perspective, personality, and preferences. So for me, I like I don't mind working at a coffee shop as long as it's the type of environment where like nobody's really gonna bother me. In like a co-working environment, the doors are more open to that kind of mingling. And I really prefer to kind of stay in my lane and focus on my work. And I do a lot of that from home. But I've done a lot of that from, I'm air quoting, home. Because for years, I traveled the world as a digital nomad. And so in any given month, home, in air quotes, was a different place. And that presented its own challenges and unique experiences. But for me, it boils down to once you're able to ditch the office, you can really kind of reverse engineer whatever kind of life that you want. Do you like working from home? Cool. Do that. Do you want to travel? Cool. Do that. Like, do you want to do it internationally or do you want to like pack up your family and go in a camper van, which I know a lot of people are doing. There's a Facebook group called We Are World Schoolers dedicated entirely to families who are traveling the world as digital nomads. And most of these parents are working normal remote jobs. (laughs) They're just doing it in a way that enabling them to, I guess, squeeze every drop out of life. And that's something that I am extra super passionate about. When I became a digital nomad in 2017, I created the Workationing podcast, which chronicled my adventures around the world, ranging from flying a plane to cage diving with great white sharks in South Africa. Cool stuff. But it's because I structured my life in a way that I had goals at each location. The purpose of the Workationing podcast was certainly to become a digital nomad, but also to knock out a bucket list item in every destination. It was to accomplish a work goal in every destination. And that's something that like I more or less accomplished along the way. And I, you know, brought friends and colleagues on the adventure with me. And we all kind of like participated in this structured vocationing adventure. And it was cool. And I feel like if people knew what was possible and then thought about what they wanted, they could patch together whatever kind of adventure they want to have, whether that's more home-based work so you can focus on maybe your side business, which involves crafting, or maybe it's not a side business at all and you really like macrame. Like, lean into that. But when you save yourself the time of the to and from work, and when you run your own show, there's certainly a lot more flexibility and there's a lot more income potential as well. So one thing you did that is... I think very motivating to a lot of people that hear your story is that you didn't have to quit a job and then sort of, you know, give up all your income and then try to make something happen as a freelancer, but you actually overlap. And a a lot of people are very scared to stop what they're doing now and to leave their current jobs because they think Mm -hmm. there has to be an end point and then a start point. And they're worried, you know, when will I start making income with my new gig? But you did it in a very kind of gradual way. It's almost like you tested the waters, found success, built up that business before you let go of the security of that W-2 full-time job. And I think that is a very inspiring story for people to hear because it, you, for especially for the commitment phobic or risk averse people, hearing that is a good thing. Well, and actually, I would not. I would not recommend to anybody to just quit your job tomorrow and wing it into the future. And let's hope your savings gets you enough runway to get from here to there. That's a quick way to burn out and <laughs> extensive therapy, probably. I did have a kick in the ass, though. I had a boss at my ad job who was sexually harassing me, and when I reported the sexual harassment went up to my male manager and then it went up to the two male co-owners 
of the company. And at the end, my manager, direct manager, the guy who sexually harassed me had to apologize, but he was still allowed to be my supervisor. I still had to interact with that guy every day. And I was just like, oh no, girl, you got to figure something out because this is not working. And I also knew that like, I couldn't just quit. I had a really good job. So I was just like, how can I, what, where, where can I find freelance writing work? I knew I was a good writer. And whether you're a good designer, whether you're a good programmer, the process still works. And again, I will include this for the show notes, but you can go to Craigslist and you can go to every major city in the US. And if you're looking for remote work, it doesn't matter it doesn't matter where you live. So for example, if you're in Wisconsin, you're probably going to make less money working for a Wisconsin-based company as a freelancer or as an employee than you would if you were working for a New York-based company. So if it's remote work, why aren't you looking for like looking in New York where those companies would be posting their remote jobs? Craigslist makes it super easy and Like I've come full circle in addition to training literally thousands of people how to hack Craigslist for, you know, your first remote work clients or jobs. I've seen, what are some other tips? I would say Craigslist is a really good one. Upwork, you're going to find, you're going to have a hard time and you're going to get low pay. And what about, uh, it's like Fiverr or other sort of freelance gig (sighs) sites. We used to have something called monster.com. To be honest, I don't really know if they're still relevant or out there. Those would be more like full-time I got my first internship on monster.com. So, you know, maybe monster works, but I can tell you from the hiring perspective, I have placed job ads on Indeed. I know we've tried monster in the past because again, (laughs) I had that experience with getting a job through monster back when I was in college. There are a media bistro. I mean, we've paid like Indeed. There's a glass door. We've tried everything. And honestly, Craigslist yields the highest number of high, highest qualified applicants than any other platform. So that's pretty much all we use. We still occasionally try out other platforms for hiring, but I mean, Craigslist really still works. And if like, I'm in a lot of Facebook groups for female entrepreneurs and digital agency owners and on a pretty regular basis, the question comes up, where do you find your talent? And a large percentage say Craigslist. So that's a great place to go because that's where people are looking for talent. That's great advice. And I think for a lot of folks, and by the way, for anyone that doesn't use Craigslist, it's just like the name, like Craig, Craigslist, um, and it's uh, .org, I believe, craigslist.org. And it's um, a really just great place for classifieds. But beware, everyone, we should put out this disclaimer too. There are a lot of scammers and, and fraud, and just like you would have in really anything on the internet, right? And so uh, beware, you know, obviously all the, the usual kind of fraud awareness that you would have if someone asks you to send money and so forth. But that's really, really great advice on how to find jobs out there, also how to hire for gig type work. Tell us a little bit about sort of what your company does and what you do as the company's CEO uh, day to day. Like what is the life of someone who works in this kind of PR agency or owns a PR agency like this? Mm -hmm. What is your life like? I think people maybe have the wrong image. I mean, maybe they picture you hunched over a computer for like hours on end and I'm sure that's wrong. So tell us like what your job is. Sure. So I'll I'll start with what the Content Factory does. The Content Factory, my company, is a digital PR agency that specializes in search engine optimization, social media marketing, obviously public relations. So like I've set up systems. And if you're into digital marketing, I would highly recommend this. In fact, if you're into any remote work, I would highly recommend this. That you figure out your standard operating procedures, right? You document those. And then you have some sort of system in place to where you don't have to train a new person. You don't have to take time to train a new person. All of that training is already outlined. You've got checklists. You've got fail safes, right? And so when you've systematized things and created these standard operating procedures, you just have to plug the right people into place. And that took me way too long to figure out. This is the Content Factory's 12th year in existence. I think I started getting hip to this 
seven years in, maybe six. I had some workflows. They were nowhere near sufficient enough to the point where I could fully step away from the company and the company could largely run itself. I just got back from a two-week vacation in Italy and I did not open my laptop one time. And the business wasn't even on fire. (laughs) It was just running as smoothly as it was when I left. Certainly, I had some emails to get back to. But when you've created the processes and you have the right people in the right seats at your company, business kind of kind of runs itself, albeit from like management work and any work that you're not able to outsource. For example, I can't outsource talking to my attorneys or accountants. I can't outsource right now like verifying the overall strategy that my managers come up with. I always seem to find like one or two things that would add to the campaign. And honestly, that's my favorite part of the job. So I wouldn't want to give it up. So as a result, over the years, I've kind of cut out the aspects of the job that I don't want to do, or quite frankly, I'm not good at. To other people who do want to do that work, they are good at it that takes that aspect off of my plate. And then I've been able to focus on, you know, my areas of genius as it were, and also like lifestyle development and hobby development. Um, So for example, a couple of years, three years ago, actually, I created Sisters in SEO, Sisters in Search Engine Optimization. And it's since become the largest network of women and gender diverse folk and very highly male dominated industry. We're up to over 11,000 members. And so that's like a hobby that brings joy to my life. It's tangentially related to my business. And again, area of expertise. But like for me, I kind of view that community building is more of a hobby than part of my work. It genuinely brings me joy. So again, it, it comes down to systems, systems and tools and people who know how to work them. <laughs> And when your hobbies dovetail with what you do for a living, usually that's a really good sign that you have picked the right profession because you're like, you know, I do this stuff on my off time and I happily do it. And I think that's always a good sign for sure. So for you, the things that you do for your clients are probably things that every entrepreneur should have help with because if you're in business, you're selling something. And if you're selling something, you need marketing and you need eyeballs to see your product and hopefully buy it. And for some of the people listening, if you have a business and your SEO is not where you know it should be or not where you know you wish it to be, what are some just quick tips that you can share? Obviously, you're not going to be able to go in depth and everybody's business is different and needs a different thing. And I know you tailor your services very specifically to each industry and client and their needs and their budget. But do you have some sort of kind of low-hanging fruit advice, uh, things that you almost always advise every entrepreneur and that you see are really just common slip-ups that are easily fixed that you could share with the audience? Sure. And I also have a resource for this one. So search engine optimization is, it's a big, hairy subject that we could spend a lot of time in, but quite frankly, it's not. It's not for everyone, especially if you don't have like pretty big budget or a lot of time and expertise to throw at it. PR though, getting your brand major media placements, surprisingly simple to do and also free if you have some time. So in the, um, I guess in the show note, we'll have a guide that my team wrote, including a pitch template to something called Hero. It's short for help a reporter out and the website is help a reporter com And essentially, this is an email service. You sign up for it. And every day, you'll get approximately 200 media queries in three separate emails that are reporters who are looking for experts to quote in their stories. Over the years, just using this very free service and the exact same pitch template that's included in the resources, my team has generated well over $10 million worth of media coverage for ourselves and our clients. So like I've gotten quoted in the New York Times, in Glamour Magazine, Fast Company, Forbes, you name it, Hero will put these opportunities in your inbox and then you just have to reply. This is a fantastic way to get that as featured in credibility. 
on your website, which helps with conversion. That is going to be something that you can, you know, call out in a variety of ways to underscore your legitimacy as an expert in whatever industry you're in. So I think that like the quick and dirty fastest way to like return on investment, like what's the most juice you can get for the least amount of squeeze, I would highly recommend Hero. And again, it's really, it's easy for some entrepreneurs. If you've got a, if you've got a decent writing capability and a decent elevator pitch, it's fairly easy for business owners to go the DIY route when it comes to public relations. And regardless of what industry you're in, it, the process is the same. The hero pitch template, it, it works for basically anyone. So like as a, what's the broadest blanket to cover everyone and the most value, that's what I would recommend. That's a great, great tip. And I actually am not only an endorser of that tip, but I'm a success story. I do use uh, that website quite a bit. And one additional tip is I, at one point, you know, there's just so many queries and so many pitch requests that come through there because you get to choose your industry and sort of the niche of the areas that you are an expert in that you would be available to be a commentator on. And one nice thing is to have an assistant or somebody on your team help you narrow those down by doing that first read and then maybe sending you just the five or, you know, 10 that that would really apply to your niche and your expertise. If you have a trusted team member with that kind of eye that, you know, would be, would have a lot of discretion and be able to, to figure out what you would pick as the ones you're interested in. That's very helpful. If you can have that team member sort of start to draft the reply back to it uh, for you with, you know, just, again, you provide some great scripts. So I highly recommend that anybody wants to start doing this, um, go to the show notes and find Carrie's resource on this very exact process so that you can start implementing it. I'm I'm trying to think what media... Well, Flavia, you you make a really great point there about being able to kick off this work to somebody like a virtual assistant. You can get a virtual assistant for, I mean, I've paid anywhere from $15 per hour on the low end to $50 per hour on the high end for like highly skilled technical work. If you don't have a team member, a personal or a virtual assistant can be that team member for you on a contract basis, uh, which means that you're not responsible for unemployment. You don't have to give them set hours. They get to do work, you know, kind of on their own time, but that's what you're doing too. So if you don't already have a virtual assistant and you're currently feeling overwhelmed with like, God, where do I begin? How do I even start digging through this pile of work? Outsource it. And then that that frees up more time for you to be in your area of genius. I remember one Harrow sort of question said, uh, we're looking for stories on interesting hidden rooms in real estate. And uh, because we have a real estate company and I happen to know someone who lives in a home that was built in uh, 1914 and it has this little prohibition era hidden room in the basement behind this door with like a little sliding cover. And it's and it looks just so like period specific. Uh, it's this amazing door. So I went over to her house We took a photo of her door and we sent it in with a short blurb and Reader's Digest published it, picked it up. And it, you know, it was was great. So it it can be such a fun kind of way to to pull things out of you that aren't necessarily things you're trying to shout out from the rooftops. But when the question comes up, you have that expertise or you have something interesting to say. And again, you're doing them a favor. (laughs) It's, It's very mutual and symbiotic because they need the content. They need the experts. They're writing articles and stories about certain topics and they need to quote people. So make yourself available. Take advantage of Carrie's advice and her resources to have at least, you know, one hour a week, go through, look at the queries and see what you can answer and opine on and hopefully get yourself out there and published more and get your name in the news or in the media or uh, magazines, articles, that sort of thing. So going back to sort of what you do in your company and advice that you have for people, what advice do you have in general for entrepreneurs who have dreams of accomplishing what you've done, which is creating a company and a lifestyle and um, a workplace of their own, you know, being your own boss? What are some of the ways that you can inspire people who want to be on that path, but aren't 
quite yet there. Oh gosh. I mean, there's, there's so many ways. Those interested can listen to the workationing podcast. And like, we, we talk a lot about how to get from point A to point B. Point A being where you are right now to point B, the life and lifestyle that you want to be living. Singular best piece of advice that I think I can give and that has really resonated with listeners of the podcast in the past is to just get started because there's never going to be a better time. I My biggest regret in business is that I didn't get started sooner. I left my job in advertising in 2005, 2006. I didn't start the content factory until 2010, but I had the idea the whole time. And in that four years, when I look at companies that were like would have been my contemporaries and I saw their growth in the market and and just how much they were able to achieve not not necessarily when i started but you know 5 years down the line i realized what a huge mistake i had made so like getting started can be anything but as long as you take small incremental steps toward your best interest every single day even if it's just one over the course of a year you'll find that you're further toward your goal and you may get there sooner sooner than you expected But having a desire and not acting toward it is really doing yourself a disservice. So like, just get started and take that first step. That first step could be sending an email, maybe forming an LLC or an S corporation, hiring an accountant or uh, talking to a lawyer to find out what what that would even look like. What's the best tax structure? for you. Dipping your toes in the water of freelance work, sending out a a couple of applications to some, you know, freelance gigs on Craigslist, whatever that, that one next step is, and you take it every single day, at least then you're not languishing in the world of what ifs, or I could have, I probably should have, and now it's too late. And by the way, it's never too late to get started. It's never too late to get started. And I like to tell people, look, sometimes you don't get started because you're afraid of doing it wrong or afraid of failure. And you know, you can't can't get hung up on that because like if someone said to you, hey, it's the law of the universe that your first three businesses will fail. So if you want a successful business, get going because you got to get those three failures out of the way so you can hit it out of the park. I think people would jump in because then the pressure's off. They're like, oh, okay, well, this one will be the flop. But when people are faced with that, hey, you've got to do this. Like you have got to hit a home run. You, you know, a lot of people think they have to quit their job and do something full time and that they have to pick the right thing too, because you know, they better pick that right thing or else it won't be successful or won't be the thing that they're looking for to change their life. There's just so much perfectionism out there. And being a risk taker is part of entrepreneurship. Sometimes just have to close your eyes and jump, even if you don't know quite where you're going with it. Of course, be cautious enough that you're not putting yourself or your family at risk financially, which is why I love that your first piece of advice, I'm a lawyer, a lot of listeners know that. So when you said, hey, kind of, you know, set business, talk to someone in the finance world and the legal world so that you do things properly. But that is a great first step because it doesn't require you to name your product or people get so hung up on names, right? Or, um, put up an ad or actually make a sale, but it does require you to take some sort of forward movement and action. And that's so important. No, and a lot of, a lot of attorneys will give you a free consultation and then at least then, you know, like, oh, maybe it's easier than I thought. Or actually it's funny to me that you say that people get hung up on names. That's part of what we do. Sometimes we create names and taglines. It's easier than you think. And in a lot of, in a lot of cases, the name doesn't really matter if you've got a fantastic product or service, right? But also if you spend all this time being hung up on a name and then you contact your attorney for the trademark and they're like, oh, sorry, it's already taken. Then you're what back? You you wasted how many hours on that? Talk to the attorney first, right? Absolutely. I think some products, the name absolutely does not matter. Other products are just the name, like the pet rock, you know, where like it really was just in the name that you had anything sellable, but getting that support, getting that advice, joining Facebook groups, like the one that you run and manage, you know, being in a community of like-minded people so that you're not out there all alone. Joining also, a if, I, not it, into it, work. if I if I could just throw out one other thing, I know we're, we're we're running a little bit long, but out of all of the logical fallacies, man, the one that really gets me is imposter syndrome. And in all of the people that I've coached, 
like I, the strongest thread among them all in their, their experience has been like the imposter syndrome. You probably have enough expertise to get started. If you're waiting for more, understand that there's somebody with half the knowledge, skill set, and experience charging twice as much as you would for less great work. So imposter syndrome, especially for women, it can you know hinder progress. And again, like talking to an attorney, I've ne- I never feel more empowered than when I after I talk to one of my attorneys. Like, oh, okay, I got this. Not so scary. For sure. So for people that want to either join one of these, the Facebook groups, learn more about your services, uh, read what you've published, how do they connect with you further after this episode? If you're interested in search engine optimization, you can join the Sisters in SEO Facebook group. The Content Factory's website is contentfactoryapplecat.com. And I'm on Facebook, LinkedIn, I love connecting on LinkedIn, Twitter, everything is at Carrie DePhillips. And I can include all that information for the show notes as well. Carrie, you are an awesome resource. So inspiring. You always have the best advice. And I want to thank you so much for sharing your time with our listeners today. Thanks so much for having me. It's been fun. Guess what, lifestyle solopreneurs? If you don't yet have an online business earning you enough passive income to live the life of your dreams, I'd like to suggest you consider trying out Kajabi. Kajabi is an all-in-one solution where you can create and teach online courses, publish a paid newsletter, launch a free or paid podcast, process payments, build one-on-one coaching portals for your clients, and much, much more. I personally use Kajabi to power numerous successful and profitable online businesses. Lifestyle solopreneurs, there's a free trial of Kajabi waiting for you at this link, www kfreetrial.com. You can try Kajabi for free, no obligation, by going to www.kfreetrial.com. Again, kfreetrial.com, and that K stands for Kajabi. Starting an online business helped me break free from that corporate grind, and I hope it does the same for you. You have nothing to lose and absolutely everything to gain. Thanks so much for tuning in today. Don't forget to subscribe to the show and see you next time.